Thank you, John. I'm just saying, I can't help it. <laughs> All right, well, before we get started in our word today, I have a, an order of business that I need to take care of. Uh, I would like Pam and Andy to come on up here, please. You in trouble. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I have had the pleasure of knowing Pam and Andy a while, way before this church was even a church, I got to know them, and I've been really fortunate to, to be able to watch how they've, their, their, their faith has grown in just the, this, the time that I know them. Uh, and about six months ago, uh, they became part of our church family, and man, what a, we, got, we got the great end of the deal on that. I got to tell you, these guys are amazing. Uh, they they have been there with everything that we could possibly have needed and done things that we didn't even ask them to do, which is exactly what somebody that's going through a probationary period should do. Uh, they have since volunteered to take care of our church for us, uh, which we are absolutely blessed to do, uh, to have them do, uh, and... You know, we're, we're, I'm excited and I'm honored to have them as part of the Victory Biker Church main team as well as part of our family. And I, I'm so grateful that, that, that they're here with us. And today's a special day for me because today I get to patch in two people that have become very close friends for me. Uh, as is custom in our church, you get, road, you get a road name when you get patched in. Yeah, be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> We're, I'm going to start with Andy. <laughs> so, when I first met Andy, uh, a Andy, Andy is a lover of motorcycles just like us, but ju just a short time ago, Andy had to give up riding, and which I can't even imagine how much that hurts. It just, I just, thought, just winter hurts me. <laughs> I can't even imagine not being able to ride. But a Andy did what everybody else, what every self-respecting guy would do, and hopefully this is what I will do if I can no longer ride. Andy went out and got rat rod built, <laughs> and it's ridiculous. So from this point forward, you will be now known as Rat Rod. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy, this is for you. You have certainly gone and er above and beyond and earned this. Thank you. Now, be afraid, Pam. Be afraid. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Pam was hard coming up with a road name for her. But I'll tell you, I live vicariously through Pam a lot of times. Because every time I turn around, I go on Facebook, and she's on some kind of an adventure. You know, whether it's heading out to Arizona or just going to Bar Harbor for the day, Pam is always on this adventure. And she's always got a smile on her face and because it, it, it's about the journey. It's not about the destination. And I absolutely love that, that about Pam's spirit. And so we decided, we went round and round and round. And you are lucky I talked Amanda out of some of the names that she wanted to give me. <laughs> but because you travel so much, we've decided to call you Wanda. Not Wanda. But you, you have also gone way above and beyond and earned this with for those of you that don't know we did a fundraiser uh, there was a there's a, a family here a gentleman a friend of mine locally that is a jiu-jitsu ninja uh, owns a jiu-jitsu school locally here uh, and he wound up having two major strokes and for a period of time is unable to take care of his family uh, we did a lunch and auction thing, which was funny because it was evidently a day they were having an open house at his gym. So it didn't really work so well for, for people that showed up, but if it wasn't for Pam, uh, Pam was, she was our boots on the ground. She went to, I can't tell you how many businesses, and convinced them to donate to us so we could still raise 1700 bucks for this family that was all from 
the people in this room. <laughs> you know, and but it, it was it was a lot of hard work by a lot of people, but Pam went without even being asked, she just took off. <laughs> and so in time, what we're going to do is we've got two rally coordinators now, which are part of the people that coordinate those types of things. Pam is going to become the third person of that team. I'm super excited to have that, that happen. Uh, so I would like everyone, please welcome our newest members to the Victory Biker Church family. Oh, evidently. Oh, I should be in the middle. Andy's going to hug me. All right. Good coffee. Bear with me. Okay. So last week, last week we did a little bit of a mini series um, called on prayer, called pressing through. Hang on, let me get back to my. You guys were a little late, so I had my my order was off. <laughs> so we did. The, we started this little mini series that we're going to finish up this week, uh, called pressing through. It's it's on prayer. This week we're going to talk about defiant prayer. And you say, man, what's defiant prayer? We're going to get into that, I promise. You know, but to kind of recap, last week the Bible teaches us that the blessings of God, the, what He wants to give us, He does that through prayer. Prayer is this conduit that we, we have that the power of God comes into us, it comes into our families. And, you know, John Wesley once said that, that God does nothing on earth except in answer to prayer. And honestly, that... To me, that's clearly an overstatement. But, you know, we get the fact that in that, he, he's meaning what God is doing is he's releasing his power on earth through prayer. Prayer is a way that we can lay hold of the promises and the blessings of God and make them ours. Because let's face it, who doesn't want that? You know, we talked about last week how the Bible is a book of 3,000 promises that God gave us. All of them are yes in Jesus Christ. And they're all for you. Every one of them. All 3,000. And we talked about how I want you guys to read your Bible. Absolutely. But I want you guys to start praying your way through what you read. That's how we claim it. And that's how it becomes ours. So prayer, prayer kind of works like a laser. Somebody got the joke. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. The way a laser works is it's light beams stacked on top of each other, right? And as, as you stack those light beams on top of each other, they intensify. When they go in the opposite directions, they cancel each other out, kind of like noise-canceling headphones. But when they go in the same direction... They increase strength, they increase power. And prayer is adding the wave of our faith to God's promises and His expressed will, and the result is the laser of God's power. I'm surprised you guys didn't get that joke. Yeah, the shark's involved on their heads. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, yeah, we'll explain it after service, I promise. Where is the power and the blessing of God absent in your life today? Is it absent because you haven't risen up and taken claim of the blessings and the power of God for your own? I've been guilty of that. Last week, we, looked, we took a look at Jacob. He was, he was a man who laid hold of the promises of God by wrestling with God all night long. And God already said the blessing was His. So, but, so Jacob wasn't trying to manipulate God into giving him what Jacob came up with. God already promised it to him. It was something that God had declared for him, but he took that blessing through wrestling with God. He pressed through. And he won his blessing. So today... I gotta move this thing. I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna knock this over, John. I'll move it back, I promise. I pace a lot, I guess. 
I told you, you were going in the back. Yeah. So anyway, today we're going to look at a, a guy that had a very similar kind of a life. Somebody that is one of the most famous heroes here in the Bible. We're going to take a look at Daniel today. So I want to show you guys three things today about Daniel's prayer. We're going to look at Daniel's defiance through prayer. We're going to look at his his discipline through prayer. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. We're going to look at his discipline, we're going to look at his defiance, and we're going to look at his endurance through prayer. Those three things are super, super important as we, as we pray. So today we're going to spend most of our time in, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 through 10. We're going to deviate a little bit because you guys know I like to squirrel. But Daniel chapter 6, and while you guys turn there, uh, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a backstory of what we're talking about today. Daniel was an Israelite captive. Uh, he, that, he'd been carried off by, by the Babylonians. Uh, I, I want you guys to think of it this way. This happened right around when Daniel was Tommy's age. Right around when he was 13 years old. So he was a kid. God had told Israel, you know, look, if you're unfaithful to me, I'm going to send you out of the promised land. I'm going to exile you. I'm going to kick you out. And you're not going to be allowed back. You decide that you've been unfaithful and you're going to return to me. Well, after repeated warnings, what happens? Israel wouldn't return from their unfaithfulness, so God kept His promise. And in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar and his armies of Babylon rode right into Jerusalem and they killed thousands of people, taking so many people captive as slaves. So as I mentioned earlier, Daniel's a kid. All right? So he's barely a teenager, and what means is Daniel probably watched his parents get murdered right in front of him. Then he gets put into a cage, put on, you know, on, the back of a, on, on the back of a truck and gets taken to Babylon. So he gets there. He gets to Babylon and Daniel gets selected as part of this program where the best and the brightest of the teenage boys, they, they get to train as interns in, in the palace, which, you know, that, that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty big deal for somebody that got taken on as a slave. And, and th- this program includes some of the Israelites. It includes some of the, some of the captives. And th- the purpose behind that was they were like, okay, well, if we take some of these captives and we brainwash them into the Babylonian ways, we can use them as leaders to lead their people to our way. Kind of makes sense. So the first thing that happens is Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, I'm gonna, I want you guys to eat this diet, okay? I'm going to give you some of the king's food. I want you guys to eat this diet. The problem with this is a lot of the food that they were told that they were going to eat is forbidden under Jewish law. So Daniel, Daniel makes up his mind, he makes up his heart that he's not going to defile himself because a man told him to do it. And so he, he, goes to the, he goes to the guy that's in charge of them, and he says, hey, look, not going to do it. Not going to do it. And he says, you kind of have to. We decided that this is the best diet to make you smartest and strongest, and you have a choice. You're either going to eat it, or you're going to die. And Daniel says, I have a, I have a counteroffer. Because Daniel's a smart guy. He says, here's the deal. Why don't you let us pick what we eat for 10 days? Let us choose our own food. And in a couple of weeks, if we've suffered for that, then you can punish us. We'll we'll take that punishment. Let me prove a point. So the guy agrees. And when, when they examine these young men after 10 days, they're in better shape than any of the other guys. Who would have, this, this is the first sign of vegetarianism, by the way. Boo. They had no bacon. Awful. Daniel chapter 2 says that God gave Daniel this incredible skill 
an incredible wisdom in math, in all the maths and all the sciences, okay? So he's setting him up to be the top of his class in this internship program. And lo and behold, God gives him the ability to interpret dreams. How cool would that be? That kind of catches people's attention because dreams are a big deal. And when, when people can't tell you what they mean, usually people die. So not only can Daniel tell you what's in the books that you're studying, he can tell you what was in your head the night before. So he's basically the ancient version of Google. And finally, it says that, that God put in him an excellent spirit, which I take to mean that he, he had this, he exuded favor. He, he had this graciousness about him, even though he was a slave. And we've all been around people that are like that. We, we, we're all, we've all been around people, hopefully we are those people, but we've all been around people that are just happy to be here. <laughs> I hopefully I'm one of those guys. And that's kind of where we pick up our story today. We're going to pick up in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Where it, it says, Darius the Mede decided to divide his kingdom into 120 provinces. And he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two, other, two others as administrators to supervise the king's high officers and protect the king's interests. So think of it like this, okay? Out of 120... There's three picked. And Daniel is one of those three. A slave boy gets picked as one of those three. Verses 3 through 5. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than any other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began to search for some fault in the way that Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance is to find grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So basically, this guy obeys God too much. And if that's the best thing they have on you, you're doing all right. Verse 6 through 8. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We're all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, Your Majesty, issue and sign the law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So the law of Medes and Persians, uh, this was kind of like a code back then. Uh, not the bro code, not the biker code, but it was still a code. Uh, it was basically, something that was signed into law couldn't be, couldn't be reversed. It was kind of like a blood covenant or a pinky swear. So verse 9 says, so Darius signed the law. Darius fell into flattery. He fell into bad political advice. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? I promise, no jokes today. And I love this next part. Check, check this out. The, the next part, verse 10 says, but Daniel learned that the law had been signed. He went home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with the, its windows open towards Jerusalem. And he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. So here's our three things. Our prayer should always be characterized by discipline. This story tells us that Daniel routinely prayed three times a day. And I'll even make the case that this is what made Daniel, this was his primary source of strength. Because he was close to God. I mean, he prayed as often as he ate. You know, D Daniel made time to.
to make sure that he was talking to God every day. The most important discipline I have is I talk to God every day. And I, for people that don't pray every day, I, I don't understand how you do it. I, I, I lived a life when I didn't have God's direction. And boy, didn't I make all the stupid mistakes. I was really good at the stupid mistakes. And then I started listening to God. I started asking questions, and I started listening, and guess what? My mistakes got less stupid. The most important thing we can do is pray every day and talk to God and read His Word. Jesus prayed all night before choosing His disciples. How many big decisions are you making without asking God what He thinks? How many decisions are you making without asking God His direction? Well, let's take an example from the flip side of that. The night before Jesus died, He took three of His closest disciples to the garden with Him to pray. We all know this story, right? So they go to the garden to pray. And because Jesus is about to go through the biggest struggle of his life, and he wants backup. We understand what backup is. We want our brothers there. When it comes down to it, I'm going through something. The first thing I want is I want you guys around me. So he leaves them in a place to pray. And he goes in a little bit further to pray by himself. And he says, he tells them that they need to pray that they won't fall into temptation. That's the important part. Okay? And when he comes back, he finds them asleep. And he wakes them up, and they're probably pretending that they were praying, oh, Jesus, bless the missionaries. Please bless the missionaries. Amen. And Jesus. But he didn't fall for it. You know, he's like, could you not even stay awake for one hour? And later that night, the same night, Peter denies him three times. So here's my question. What if Peter had stayed awake? What if Peter stayed awake for that hour? Jesus told him to stay awake and to pray that he wouldn't enter temptation. Maybe, just maybe, maybe he wouldn't have crumbled that night and made the biggest mistake of his life. And when Jesus finds Peter sleeping, he says, well, the, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Exactly. That's exactly right. But what if prayer means is a means of God strengthening our spirit to avoid temptation and to snap the world's power over you? Anybody that knows me knows I'm a reader. Love to read. I love to read about people's experiences through Jesus. And I was reading this book called The Circle Maker. And on July 16, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin, uh, they propelled Apollo 11 into space. Okay? The rocket itself weighs 102,907 pounds, carries 5,625,000 pounds of fuel. That's a lot of gas. And at takeoff, the five engines produce 7,500,000 pounds of thrust to reach the escape velocity of 17,500 miles an hour required to break Earth's gravitational pull. Call it a number. Prayer is how God releases His wisdom and power and change in you. Prayer is the way to escape the gravitational pull of the flesh and enter God's orbit. Hear that. And I'm not saying three is the magic number. Praying three times a day is not the magic number. But what if you bathed your day in prayer? What if, what if you prayed through your calendar every day? It's something that I've actually started doing since the first of the year. This is, this is my agenda for today. These are the meetings that I have. These are the people that I need to talk to. And this is the stuff that I need to accomplish. God, I need your will in every one of these things. Show me 
fill me and put the words in my mouth that I need to say to make this an effective day. What if you try that? Because I hear this a lot. Oh, I just pray regularly throughout my day. No, you don't. You get busy just like we all do. Set a time. Be disciplined. Spend some time with God. You won't regret it. I teach this to my kids. You know, every day when I take my kids to school, we pray on the way to school. And every night when, we go, when they go to bed, my kids, my kids and I pray together. I'm teaching them discipline. I'm teaching them this, it, it is time to spend a few minutes with God and say thank you or God, please help me through this day. Before I get into my next point, though, I want to share the cool ending to the astronaut story. <clears throat> so on Sunday, July 20th, 1969, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong land uh, the Eagle in the Sea of Tranquility on the moon. First thing they do, and this is something that you do not see in the official history, is they celebrate communion. Yeah. They celebrate communion. This is for Joanna. Here's a little fun fact for you. Fun fact for Joanna. You don't see this and you don't hear about this because the ACLU filed a lawsuit that prohibited that being shown on national television in 1969. So the news broadcasts decided they were going to black it out. Anyways, Buzz Aldrin, which this is something I didn't know, Buzz Aldrin was an elder in the Presbyterian church. So he took out bread and he poured the wine. And yeah, they were drinking in space, just letting you know. Scary. So they decide they're having communion up there. And, you know, gravity is like one-sixth of what it is. Here, the wine starts floating around in a little bubble. That must have been pretty cool. So Buzz Aldrin reads John 15 and 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Why bother praying? Well, there's the answer. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the answer. Nothing of lasting spiritual value will ever come unless God's hand is in it, guys. That's important. You have to develop discipline in prayer. I could talk about this for days, honestly. I, I, I find that stuff fascinating. But let's get on to number two. Number two my favorite topic, defiance. Our prayer should be characterized by defiance. Now, I know what you're saying. We're not supposed to be Christians. We're not supposed to be defiant. Defiance of what? Defiance of Babylon's laws that say, don't obey God. Yeah, we're supposed to be defiant against that. But there's something more here. When Daniel prayed, he was... He was defying a situation that he didn't want to be in. And he was defying a situation where he believed God wanted to change that situation. If we look at one of the, the, the words of one of Daniel's prayers, you know, this is in Daniel 9, 17 through 19. It says, Oh God, oh our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead for your own sake, Lord. Smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act for your own sake. Do not delay, oh my God, for your people and your city bear your name. That prayer is a model prayer. And there's so much in there. I mean, I could do a whole series on just that, just that little section there. I'm not going to do that, I promise. But this is what I see. I see a spirit of, of repentance. And I see a spirit of humility. 
You know, God isn't going to hear you when you start defying Him. That's a big deal right there, church. When we start saying, God, I know better than you do. Hey, God, I know you said to do this, but this is my way, and my way seems better for me. Nope. Guaranteed. I see great hope in God's mercies here, too. He says, we make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. God doesn't answer hope. God God answers our prayers because of His mercy. God doesn't hear prayers based on the idea that we're worthy to give them to Him. He hears our prayers because He's merciful. But I also see in this, I see in this an awareness of the promises of God. What Daniel demands here in his prayer, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. It's near verbatim a quote of a promise God gives in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 30 for people that take notes, by the way. And it's the, the promise is that as, if, as Israel goes into exile, when they repent, God would restore them back to the nation. You see what Daniel's doing? We talked about this last week. Daniel is holding, he's catching God in his words. He's holding God to his promises. God, you said this. Now let's make it happen. You guys are taking notes. I want you to write this down. Effective prayer begins when you perceive the gap between where a situation is and where God wants it to be. Okay. You got it. Effective prayer begins when you perceive the gap between where a situation is and where God wants it to be. Jesus taught us to pray Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We see a gap here. And we pray it into existence. We add the wave of our faith to the wave of His will. And therefore, we release the laser of God's power. I'm glad somebody gets my jokes today. The trick to that is it needs to be done with humility. Because we don't always know what God's will is. We get closer to God's will and we get closer to seeing God's will the more we read His Word. And the more we spend here in this book, we start to figure out what God's will is. And then he tells us what his will in our life is. So here's another question for you guys. How well do you know the Word of God? The strength of our prayers are entirely dependent on our knowledge of God's Word. Because how are we going to ask if we don't know? We talked about this last week. This book is our prayer book, church. Our ability to lay hold of God's promises are entirely dependent on our knowledge of His Word. These are His promises. And He gives them all to us. We should know what these promises are if we want them. I'll take every single one of them. Prayers that are effective Begin and end with the promises of God. We all know when we pray selfishly, you usually run into problems. God, I want another Harley. A third one would look really good in my shed right now. (laughs) Chances are, that's probably not God's will right now. (laughs) It'd be nice if it was. God, heal my brother because he's sick. It's the intent of your heart. You 
can't know God's will more than you know his word. So get into his word. In prayer, we perceive that, that we perceive the will of God for a situation and we defy the situation that we're currently in by praying. And we and God will change that. Just like He did here in this story, guys. Let me tell you guys, you guys know I like stories, so I'm gonna tell you guys a story. There was a young Scottish pastor in the 19th century. His name was John Patton. And he had really successful church in Scotland. Really successful church. He was reaching everybody. But God put on his heart, he became increasingly burdened for this little tiny chain of islands in the Pacific Ocean that were inhabited by people that had never heard the gospel of Jesus before. They've never heard. Nobody knew who Jesus Christ was. Problem was, the islands are inhabited by cannibals. That is a big problem. <laughs> and they have this history of anybody that comes on their island, they become a snack. So there's no Westerner that knows their language. There's no way to communicate this. And chances are they're probably going to get eaten if they go. And, you know, how, how do you start a church in an environment like that? You know, it's not like you can pass out flyers inviting people to an Easter service, bring a friend, bring snacks, same thing. <laughs> you know, how do you do that? Somebody's going to eat your butt. But Patton knew that God wanted him to go because he knew that God didn't want a single person to perish without knowing who Jesus was. So he resigns from his church and he hops on a boat and he goes to Cannibal Palooza. And so many people tried to discourage him on this trip. You know, one of my favorite stories that, that I read about this was this, this person says, I, he says, I was besieged with the strongest opposition on all sides. One of my seminary professors told me that I was leaving certainty for uncertainty. Boy, doesn't that sound like the will of God. I was leaving work in which God had made me greatly useful only to throw my life away for the cannibals. One dear old Christian deacon said to me, Son, the cannibals! The cannibals! And I love his response. I replied, Mr. Dixon, you're advanced in years now. And your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave there to be eaten by worms. If I can live and die by serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or eaten by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair and well as yours in the glorious likeness of our Redeemer. That's defiance! And he says, indeed, the opposition was so strong from nearly all that I was driven to really seek God in prayer. But again, every doubt would vanish when I clearly saw that these poor men and women created in God's image would perish without even the chance of knowing all God's love and mercy. Talk about a mission, church. Welcome to Central Maine. Minus the cannibals, hopefully. But Patton's lifelong ministry was both brutal and exhilarating. You know, he lost his wife um, on this island. She died. She didn't get eaten. She died during childbirth, their first child. And, you know, he, he had to sleep on, on their grave because the, the child died too. He had to sleep on their grave for three to four days so the cannibals didn't come dig him up and eat him. Ew. Right? He was under constant siege, day and night. And he was always on the lookout. I guess you kind of have to be looking over your shoulder to see if somebody's chewing on you. One of my favorite stories in his biography, though, was one of the chiefs of one of the tribes had come to him after, after coming to Christ, and he says, 
I need to ask you, who was the army that guarded your hut day and night when you first got here? Hey, goosebumps, thinking about this. Apparently, the angels of God surrounded this family so the gospel could be heard on these islands. You know, when he arrived on this island back in 1858, not a single person knew who Jesus was. And when he died some 30 years later on that island, every single person professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Talk about a mission. He filled a gap. Where do you see a gap? Those of us that serve. Those of us that are intent on serving. Our whole day is involved in filling a gap. Agreed? And I'm going to say this. I perceive a gap between where our church is and where God wants it to be. I perceive us where, God, where we are now and what God wants His Gospel situation to be not just here at Victory Biker Church, but in Central Maine as well. You know, I, I believe that God wants His Gospel to be famous here in Central Maine again. Because right now it's not. I believe that He wants the bikers and the misfits, the people that we're trying to reach, I believe that those people that find their way to our door, I, I pray that God that they I pray to God that they find that Jesus is a better way than the lust of their flesh. I pray that the, they find that the gospel provides better answers than skepticism and atheism do. Because those are the two biggest enemies we have right now. And I believe that he wants this profound spirit of gospel unity between churches. I've said that from day one about this church. One of the missions of this church is to start breaking down barriers and building bridges between us and other churches because I am tired of that denominational divide. It doesn't exist in the Bible, so it shouldn't exist in the church. It is time. God is calling us if we're going to affect this state, if we're going to affect New England, if we're going to affect our country, and I believe we will, if we're going to do that for Jesus, we got to start breaking down walls and start building bridges. I believe that God wants His Gospel available to the homeless, to the addicts, and to the people that have always said, I will never set foot in a traditional church because those people are hypocrites. Guess what? This is not a room full of hypocrites. If we're going to reach the lost and the broken people in our state, God is laying out the plan for us to do so. And I believe that He wants to give us this, this rebirth of relationship. Not just with Him, but with each other. He wants to rebirth relationships between fathers and sons and mothers and children and brothers and sisters. And I believe in the mission of our parent church, Victory Biker Church International, where they, they were told they, were, they needed to plant 777 churches throughout the world. That's a lot of churches, people. But I believe we're one of them. And look at, how God is, look at what God has done in this place. Now we need 776 more people to step up and say, I'm willing. I'm going to follow. Because we need to be strong in the places where there is no strength. That's our job. And I believe all of this because God's Word tells us this. And if I defy the situation... Not like this. And I claim the promises of God. And I ask Him to help us change it. Guess what? He will. Every time. So bring it on the King Dariuses of the world. I'm going to call him Joe Biden. Bring it on. 
put us in a lion's den because we serve a God that shuts the mouth of lions. Last point. Our prayers should be characterized by endurance. Let's take two quick observations of Daniel's life. First, Daniel was willing to be thrown in a lion's den before he was willing to stop praying. How valuable is prayer to you? Daniel was willing to lose his life over it. How much of a priority do you put on it? My challenge to you is this. Start a daily Bible reading and prayer time. Every day. Every day. I don't care if it's five minutes. Let God talk to you. It's a game changer, church. Game changer. Watch how he blesses you. Number two, Daniel was willing to persist in prayer until God answered. How many times do we pray, oh dear God, I need this. Five minutes later, he didn't answer my prayer. Boy, doesn't that sound like my house. The return, of, the return from exile didn't happen for over 70 years, church. 70 years! That's the age of an average person now. Daniel prayed for 60 years before the answer was given. 60 years! Would you pray that long for something? When my ex-wife and I were told that we couldn't have children, we believed God when He said, you're going to have a child. My two little heathens are running around in that room, by the way. But it took almost 11 years of prayer and standing on God's Word for Georgia to be born. Persistence and endurance. How long are you willing to pray for something? It's another interesting piece for you guys. Daniel, at one point, was praying about something, and he was praying down by the river, and a man clothed in bright linen walks up to him and says this in Daniel 10, 10, 11 through 11-13. I know that writing is a little tiny. I'm sorry, guys. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God, so listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up, still trembling. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. I've come in answer to your prayer, but for 21 days the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came, and helped, came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit of the prince of the king of Persia. That just drips awesome as far as I'm concerned. And it's a little confusing. So on the day Daniel starts to pray, his words are hurt. And this guy, this guy gets sent with the answer to his prayer, but it takes 21 days. And along that way, he, he comes along some, de, some demonic presence, and he's engaged in a battle for 21 days. So Daniel doesn't hear right away an answer. You ever look up and think, what's going on up there? I asked. Come on, God, I asked. You know the intent of my heart. Where's my answer? If you knew what was happening while you were praying, it would blow your mind. But while this angel was being held up, Daniel kept praying. 21 days. And then another angel named Michael, who's kind of like the Jack Bauer of angels, he shows up around day 20, and he starts kicking butt, and he helps out the first angel. And it doesn't say directly that the second angel came because Daniel kept praying. It doesn't say that. But you have to wonder about that connection. You have to wonder. What if Daniel quit praying at day 20? 
don't know. What do you think might have happened? There's so much mystery here, it's probably not a good idea to speculate. But what if he stopped? But I know the uniform teaching in this scripture, and as I shared with you guys last week, that some answers are only given in response to persistent prayer. You guys kind of giggled at me when we talked about persistent prayer last week, but it's true. And I struggle with the persistent prayer thing. I'm not going to lie, I'll be honest with you guys. How do you know when to keep persisting and when to rest in God's goodness? There's a fine line there, and I've yet to find it. So if anybody else finds it, please let me know. But Paul, in 2 Corinthians 12 and 19, he prayed three times for God to change something in his life. And finally, God gets back to him and says, Paul, not going to do it. Not going to do it. I'm not changing your situation. But what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you my grace in your situation. You know, Jesus once told his disciples that they shouldn't pray like pagans who, who think God will hear them just because they talk a lot. And that their Heavenly Father knows what they're asking even before they ask it. So some things, some things that we pray for, even the good things, even the good things, we're not going to get no matter what. I mean, hear me out. No matter how long we pray, that might not be within God's will for our lives. That stinks. Because we want. And we want our stuff. I want what's due to me. But the Bible tells us to knock and keep on knocking. You know, remember the, uh, remember the widow from last week that we talked about? Hey, judge! Did you get my email yet? Remember her? The persistent widow we talked about last week. Persistence. Be like Jacob who wrestled and took claim for what was his. Be like Daniel who pressed on for 21 days. Who pressed on for 60 years. You know, the, the early church, they, they prayed all night for Peter's release in Acts 12. All night. When was the last time anybody prayed all night? And honestly, I can't tell you which, but there, there, there's tension. There, there, there's tension, and the Holy Spirit has to guide you in this. And when something... Let me back up a second. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> when it's something that you're sure of, and when it's something that's in God's Word, and that you're interpreting God's Word correctly for your life, and it's something that God wants for you, don't give up. Press in. Be persistent. It's important. makes me think of a couple that I, I, I used to go to church with years ago. There was this woman, her name was Sharon. Uh, her husband wanted no part of living for Jesus. They were married forever. And her husband, was un, he was the definition of unsaved. You know, if you were to look it up at the dictionary, there was a picture of Joe like this. But he was adamant about not living for Jesus. And after, you know, after a few years of me being in this church, all of a sudden she came to church, she was very upset and told me that Joe had had enough of that Jesus crap and he moved out. And every day before this, every day that I knew Sharon, Sharon prayed for her husband. She asked for prayer for her husband. We as a church prayed for her husband that he would at least listen to Jesus. 
But eventually he decided, I can't have this in my life, and he moved out. But she kept praying. She kept praying. And in 2015, I can honestly tell you guys that through some pretty remarkable circumstances, I was sitting in the church praying one day, and in came Joe. And he walked right up to the altar, and he went right down to his knees, and he started praying. And through some remarkable circumstances called cancer, Joe gave his life to God. He submitted his life to Jesus, and God saved him. And he brought him back, and he reconciled with his wife, and he healed him of cancer. And they still serve in their church every week. Endurance church. That was 20 years of prayer for one thing. I had the pleasure of helping with his baptism in 2016. All because a woman prayed faithfully for 20 years. because She wasn't willing to give up. Not because of the relationship, but she didn't want to see him go to hell. It was his salvation, then the relationship. So I want to wrap up our message today with the conclusion of our story with Daniel. So Dan, we all know that Daniel gets thrown in with the lions. Does not sound like a good way to spend the night. King Darius never wanted this to happen because he liked Daniel. But he was gullible and he was weak. And so King Darius stayed up all night worrying about Daniel. And I'm assuming Daniel's enemies, they probably stayed up all night too partying. He's getting eaten. Anyway. They, nobody got a good night's sleep. They were probably hung over looking for a really strong cup of coffee that next morning. So at daybreak, Darius gets up. He runs down to the lion's den to check to see if Daniel somehow made it. And Daniel was there. Drinking up a cup of coffee. Reading between the lions. Two or three guys reading between the lions. That was a, that was a dad joke for you. Though. She didn't laugh. God kept Daniel safe. God kept Daniel safe through his prayer. And the plot of these wicked men was overturned and God was glorified. That's the big picture. But I don't want you guys to think that this message is that simple. If you pray and trust God, He's always going to keep you safe and deliver you from harm. We know that that's not true. We've talked about that. Lots of, God, lots of God's people die in a lion's den. The message of this story points beyond that. Like all Old Testament stories do, Daniel points you to somebody more impressive, more heroic than himself. Daniel was innocent. And he was sentenced to death. We all know somebody else that was innocent and sentenced to death. Jesus. Daniel trusted God in pretty impressive ways. I don't know if I could do that. Put me in there with lions. I'm probably going to get eaten. But there was one who trusted God more than Daniel. And that was Jesus. Daniel came out of the lion's den without a scratch. Jesus came out of his trial filled with wounds. And what that tells me is that whatever trial I'm going through, I'm safe. I'm going to be all right because God's got my back. And I know that God loves me. And I know his presence is with me, and he's never going to leave me, and he's never going to forsake me. 
And there have been times in my life, way before today, that I questioned that. So I can pray for 60 years. Because I know God cares and God hears me. And I can handle it when I cry out for deliverance from the lions and it doesn't come. Because Jesus has proven His love for me and His commitment to me when He hung on a cross. The name Daniel means God is my judge. The Gospel is that God was judged for me. Jesus came and was judged for me. He was judged for you guys, but I like to say he was judged for me. So I can say I have no judgment to fear at all. Because I know when my time comes, God is going to see me through that lens of Jesus Christ. And I can say in every situation, God is for me. Who can be against me if God is for me? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I can press through in prayer. I can persist and I don't have to be discouraged because The cross shows me how much Jesus loved me. And He still does. He made the power of His healing and His salvation fully available to all of us. Because it was purchased by His blood when He hung on that cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You so much for this Word. This is a word that was needed today. This is a message that I needed to hear again. And I hope somebody that that, that was watching this or somebody that was here today heard this and it pricked their heart. Lord, I ask that as we pray and we live our lives that, that You give us these three things. Help us to pray in a defiant way that defies this world that tells us that You don't matter anymore. Because you're the most important thing that we have. You are the center and the all of our being. God, I ask that you bless the people that are here today. Thank you for everybody that's here. Thank you for the people that watch us online. And Lord, I just ask that, that people that are struggling... Let them pray. Let them reach out to You and let them be persistent until they get an answer from You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John, you got another song for us? Oh, hang on a second.